Welcome back, everyone. It's the Bourbon Judge. Man, I am excited for today's episode. So I actually had a couple different people reach out to me, patrons and subscribers. Uh, a couple people reached out, but one in particular, my buddy uh, Troy. Um, Troy was the reason why I was like, you know what? It's time. Uh, so I had a lot of people reach out just saying, hey, Judge, you know, I'm a part of a whiskey group. There are a lot of people that, you know, are not experts when it relates to like whiskey, bourbon and rise and so forth. Can you just give a quick overview? And then when, when Troy reached out, I was like, you know what? Seal the deal. It's time to kind of go back to the, the basics, right? Go back to whiskey 101, if you will, at least as it relates to bourbon and rye. We're going to try to keep this high level. Um, so I'm going to give you different options and all the different meanings as it relates to bourbon and rise in the whiskey world. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, the different meanings, uh, what do they all mean? Again, kind of trying to keep it high level, as well as give you an example of one bottle of each. Cool? And hopefully most of these bottles, not every single one, but at least most of them, you can find at least a good number of these bottles on the shelf. Fair? All right. So first and foremost, before I even bring out some bottles, let's just talk about the difference of a bourbon versus a rye. All right, so here we go. So when you think of uh, whiskey itself, think of almost look at it like ingredients, or we refer to it as a mash bill. So in order for something to be called bourbon, high level again, it has to be at least in the mash bill or the ingredients, at least 51% corn. The other 49% can be in combination of uh, typically either rye, malted barley, or wheat. Uh, it could be one of those three. It could be just one if you want, uh, but it has to be at least 51% corn in order for it to be considered bourbon. And of course, obviously it ages in new American oak and so forth. The same actually goes for rye, but on the opposite side. In order for something to be a rye whiskey, it has to be 51% rye. And then the other 49%, again, can be a mix of corn, malted barley, or wheat. So that's really the key difference of a bourbon versus rye. It's all kind of based off of quote unquote, the mash bill, AKA the ingredients of when, you, when you're actually making uh, whiskey itself. Um, and then both of those products obviously are then aged in oak barrels anywhere from two, three, four years, sometimes even up to 15 or 20 years. That's the very high level Cliff Notes version of a bourbon versus a rye. A bourbon, by the way, also will be a little bit sweeter where a rye, typically is a little bit more spicy, a little bit more peppery and so forth. So that's the key differences between bourbon or rye. Again, trying to keep this high level. Fair? All right, so let's go through all these different categories. The first category is bottled and bond. So what does that mean, Judge? And how, how do I know what bottled and bond means and what to look for? So this is an example of a product coming from Heaven Hill. So bottled and bond, so very uh, quick version, bottled and bond means that it was aged at least four years, the proof is always gonna be exactly 100 proof, so exactly 100 proof, and it's gonna be aged in a government controlled warehouse. The whole concept uh, behind Bottled and Bond started back, way back in the uh, late 1800s because prior to the Bottled and Bond Act, which is a true actual government act, um, prior to that, when people were making whiskey in like the late 1800s, they were making whiskey and they were doing whatever to it, like throwing in tobacco leaves, throwing in anything to make the whiskey darker, to appear to be like aged more, if you will. Uh, so in order to kind of set some standards regarding whiskey, uh, they created the Bottled and Bond Act, which basically says that the whiskey has to be made at least, or aged at least four years. It has to be um, uh, obviously in a government controlled warehouse where the government can actually come in and kind of spot check it. And it has to be exactly 100 proof. And there are a couple of the little nuances, but that's like really the core of it. It was all about the integrity of keeping the whiskey safe so that when you and I sip it, we're not sipping uh, tobacco leaves inside of our whiskey. All right, this is one example. Not that you can find it in every single shop, but in a lot of shops. All right, so that is the Heaven Hill. So Heaven Hill is the brand, and that is their version of Bottled and Bond. Cool? All right, what is next? So next we're gonna go to something called Small Batch. So this is a, um, a concept, and this, by the way, this bottle, this is Michter's. So this one is about a 40, 45 hour bottle, just kind of depending where you're at. So Small Batch essentially means that, so when whiskey ages in barrels, a lot of times whiskey comes out in the barrel. One barrel may not be the best, but the next barrel next to it, when you combine the two of them, it might form a really cool batch. So in, may, in many cases, a lot of times, many distilleries, many brands will have on the front, it'll say small batch. And that typically means that a whole bunch of barrels, at least two obviously, but a whole bunch of barrels were blended together to create a small batch. And a small batch is almost like, it's like the standard form of any whiskey brand. Most whiskey brands, 
typically have a small batch, which is truly just a combination of various different uh, barrels. What you're looking for with a small batch is consistency. So each time you buy a bottle of, in this case, Michter's small batch, the, each each small batch, it should be somewhat similar, no matter if you're buying a bottle here in my state of Delaware to if I go to you know California or Texas. If I'm buying a bottle of Michter small batch, there should be some consistency um, across all the different blends because they're blending a whole bunch of barrels together. So they're looking from it from that perspective of having a small batch. Cool? All right. Next, we're gonna go to a single barrel. So let's just stay with Michter's. So single barrel, as it says here right on the front of this Michter's, and this is by the way, a rye whiskey. Uh, this is a single barrel. So for Michter's, for their standard uh, rye whiskey, each and every bottle that you'll find will always be a single barrel. That means all of the whiskey that was dumped out of a barrel, and most barrels, by the way, typically yield about 180 bottles, sometimes more, sometimes less. It just kind of depends on how much uh, from like from an aging standpoint and then how much goes to the, as they call it, the uh, the angel share, how much evaporates essentially. But a single barrel means that all the whiskey from one barrel went into, again, 180 bottles as an example. Cool. So you will always can tell the barrel number. So it says it right up here on the front. So this is the barrel number for my bottle. Uh, if you're going in California or Texas, the odds are more than likely you probably don't have the same uh, barrel number as me uh, because again, this is a single barrel, all the whiskey coming from one barrel. So that is how uh, Michter's uh, produces their rye whiskey. That's just something that they've done and that works very well for them. Cool. All right. Whew. Three down, a couple more to go, a couple more categories. All right, so that was a single barrel. So now let's talk about something called cast strength or just barrel proof, right? So cast strength or barrel proof. So for cast strength or barrel proof, this is a brand, you can typically find this in most shells. So this is Penelope. So Penelope is, and this is their barrel strength. So what does that mean, Judge? Barrel strength or cast strength? Those names you can actually use interchangeable, meaning that for the most part, all the whiskey, it was dumped out of the barrel and they did not add any water to proof it down. So in the case of, let's just use, go back to Michter's. In this case, Michter's comes in at 91.4 proof. When the whiskey came out of the barrel, it was probably like 105, 110. They added water to bring it down to the small batch to be exactly 91.4 proof. Where with this one, which is the Penelope barrel strength or cast strength, in this case, they didn't add any water at all it truly they truly they took the barrel they dumped it out and all the uh, contents from the barrel uh went into you know bottles so it's the pure form it's purely cast strength no water added if you're newer to whiskey you may want to hold off on buying something that is either barrel proof or cast strength unless you just want to try it for fun try it and let me know <laughs> all right let me get a quick sip of whiskey hey real quick three quick easy favors number one hit the like button number two drop me a comment let me know what are your thoughts on the various different categories we covered today and are there any other ones that you think we should have added in last but not least please make sure you all subscribe to the channel cheers mm. Whew, that's good all right so that is barrel proof slash cast strength now what might be a little confusing just a little bit you have barrel strength and cast strength i'm sorry barrel proof and cast strength as interchangeable words right barrel strength and cast strength, right? However, there's something also called foolproof. I know, you're like, judge, come on, with all these different uh, categories. So this is an example of, this is 1792 foolproof. So foolproof essentially means, for the most part, that the company, uh, they want to set a standard as it relates like to their whiskey, meaning that they want it to be a certain proof point. And they want that proof point to be essentially almost cast strength. So for 1792, their version of full proof is always at 125 proof. So what does that mean? When something, when a barrel, when the whiskey comes out of the barrel, if it's 130 proof or if it's 135 or 137, they're adding just a little bit of water to bring it down to 125 proof. They're not making it, they're not adding a ton of water, like in this version of the small batch where they bring it down to 91.7. They're just adding just, I'm talking just 
barely a little bit of water to bring it down to an exact proof, in this case, 125 proof. A lot of brands, um, they will have a full proof uh, set. Sometimes it's 125, sometimes it's 120. It's just kind of based off of, you know, uh, their, like let's call it like their internal, the way that they kind of age their barrels and so forth and what they want as a full proof item. So. It's not pure cast strength, but it's very close to it. So you're not talking about a huge difference from a cast strength to like a standard, like foolproof from a, a, how much water they add. It's not much at all. So no water, talking about just a little bit of water with foolproof, cool? Small batch, they've added a lot of water because it's probably down in the more than likely, more than likely in the 90s or 100 proof uh, area. Fair? All right, so that's a foolproof example. Now, if you've ever went into a liquor store and you see, you know, a barrel of whiskey and bottles on top of it and you're like, and it says private barrel pick. Ooh, that seems sexy. <laughs> what does a private barrel pick mean? So essentially, many stores and also Facebook groups, um, Think of like whiskey tubers such as myself and my good friend stuff and whiskey and SLB drinks. Um, we have our own version of a private barrel pick. And what does that essentially mean? That pretty much means that we travel to a distillery and we really wanted to pick one single barrel for our, our, our group, our, in this case for my patrons, picking a single barrel from a distillery and from a proof standpoint, we're doing pure castering. So in this example, this is a, a barrel pick of a uh, Driftless Glen. So essentially uh, from my group, we, you know, we, we picked a single barrel from Driftless Glen. This is a rye whiskey, by the way. Uh, we picked, of course, obviously the best one. We, you typically can test five, six, seven different barrels out. So we picked the best one for our group that we thought had the best, obviously, nose, palate, finish, that just was honestly just damn good whiskey. So for this one, this was a single barrel private pick that we did for, for my group, for the Bourbon Judge group. But other groups do them, stores do them, Facebook groups do private barrel picks. You'll typically find them by a sticker. So on the side here, this shows a little sticker, it says pick by the Bourbon Judge along with uh, some of my, my other good friends from other channels as well. Um, and that is a private barrel pick. All right, we're making good progress. Only three categories left. Now we're gonna go to a finished bourbon. So what is a finished bourbon or even a finished rye? What does that really mean, Judge? So what that means is typically whiskey obviously ages in a, a new American oak barrel for three, four, five, six, seven years. Uh, many companies in today's environment, they like to use a secondary barrel to kind of, you know, so they take all the whiskey, they dump it out, and then they take that dumped whiskey and they put it into another barrel. And that other barrel might have been like a wine finish, like a Merlot, a Sherry, a Cognac. In this case, this is bourbon whiskey that's coming from Starlight. And Starlight, they're kind of like the kings, if you will of finished whiskeys, meaning that the majority of their product line is bourbon or rye that they then take and they dump it in X barrels that, that was previously filled uh, with another liquor, liquor. So in this case, this is bourbon whiskey finished in Armiac barrels. So again, they took all their bourbon from you know numerous barrels or one barrel, they then dumped it into a empty barrel and that empty barrel in that case previously had Armiac in it. They typically leave the whiskey in there for like three to six months and then they dump it out and they put it into bottles. You know, everyone has different ones that they like and different ones they don't like. Um, I like a lot of different finished bourbons because if you're a big cigar smoker, typically they're a little bit sweeter because they are normally the uh, finished bourbons arise. They're typically um, coming from like different, like either wine or cognac or in this case, Armiac and so forth. So they're a little bit sweeter, typically, not always. All right. Now we are at uh, the end of the road. We got two left, two big categories. So Judge, give me an example of, you mentioned rye earlier. Tell me a really good rye whiskey that's on the market that you can typically find in most stores. Not every single store. Remember, distribution changes. No matter if you're on the East Coast, West Coast, down South, no matter where you're at, everything changes. But this is a rye whiskey coming from Pikesville. So Pikesville is a phenomenal whiskey. Also about a $50 bottle, maybe 55, just kind of depending on where you're at. Great quality whiskey. Again, in order for it to be a rye whiskey, what does it have to have in the mash bill? At least 51% rye. The other 49% could be corn, malted barley, or wheat. 
but for this one, it has to be at least 51% rye in the mash bill. And this is a phenomenal, honestly, I, I think a phenomenal everyday rye whiskey. All right, last but not least. So this is a unique one, very unique. Didn't want to throw too many curveballs, but I said, hey, we're on a roll. Let's do one last curveball for these categories. So the last category is think of a weeded bourbon. Oh, Judge, what are you doing? Weeded bourbon? What are you talking about? All right. You have bourbon, you have rye. We talked about finished bourbons. Now we're going to talk about a weeded bourbon. So what does that mean, Judge? A weeded bourbon, and this is a great example, by the way, of a weeded bourbon. This is larceny. A weeded bourbon means that it's still a bourbon. So that means it's still 51% corn in the mash bill. However, the secondary ingredient, right? Remember, it could be the other 49%. The secondary ingredient, the majority of it has to be wheat. It can still have rye or malted barley in the, uh, the other 49%, but the majority of that other 49% has to be wheat in order for it to be called a weeded bourbon. And typically, a weeded bourbon is typically a little bit sweeter without having to go down the whole finishing route. A weeded bourbon is typically a little bit sweeter uh, because wheat, as well as uh, corn, makes the bourbon itself very sweet naturally. Hey, friends! Hopefully, this uh, episode uh, helped a lot of uh, a lot of our new uh, friends that are new to the whiskey world that are out there. Until the next time, I appreciate you watching today's episode. Peace, cheers, most important salute. Take care, everyone. See ya.